Let's begin our second session in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are the among women, and blessed is the word of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary of the Word incarnate, be the Mother of the Word within us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> As I was putting my notes together for this, I was trying to figure out how I was gonna do two 45 minute t talks because the first one I knew I would be pushing 45 minutes. The second one I thought maybe I might be a little short, but the Holy Spirit being such a benevolent uh, spirit has uh, made it so that I have to start my second session with something that I <clears throat> was unable to come around to in the first. And that's just a brief excursus on Evagrius of Pontus. Um, mainly I need, to, I need to mention him because he has a huge influence uh, uh, over John Cash and, and Isaac of Nineveh, who I'll be talking about today. I'm not going to get terribly much into him, but Evagrius was the late 4th century. He was an Egyptian, and uh, he was most well known for his development of the eight, or as we would have them now, the seven deadly vices or sins. This was a huge part of his theology and understanding. He's also believed uh, to be the one who started to write down the Apophthegamata Patrum, the sayings of the Desert Fathers, um, which is the book that I referenced earlier. And um, to be honest, he was also condemned, though indirectly, for some of his views, um, especially because of his connection and uh, through the originist school of spirituality and theology. But he is, as I mentioned earlier, all the rage right now in intellectual circles, and a lot of his stuff is being translated and he's being re, uh, reconsidered and rethought. In terms of his spiritual life, and this is why I, I bring up Evagrius, he talks about several things, and there are four important points that I would like to talk about because they influence both Isaac of Nineveh, who was a hermit, and John Cashin, who was uh, establishing a monastery outside of what is Marseille, France, in the fourth, or late 4th, early 5th century. <clears throat> the first point that Evagoras makes about the spiritual life is that it's a gentle ascent requiring patience. That again, we don't just dive into the deep end of the spiritual life and find ourselves, we actually have to work our way up to that level of prayer. It requires humility, penitence, and recollection. And now who does this sound like but not Cardinal Sarah, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, he has a huge impact on the spiritual life. Again, it requires humility, penitence, and recollection. We have to know who we are, and we have to act in accordance with changing our brokenness. The quality and depth of prayer is much more important than the quantity for Evagrius. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this influences Cashin, who talks about this, and Cashin in turn influences St. Benedict. And so when St. Benedict talks about prayer, especially communal prayer, he talks about the simplicity, the beauty of it, but also not so, unless you're moved by the Spirit, not so spending so much time in prayer itself. Having those times of prayer, but making them deep moments of prayer. And this is another thing that is very important from Evagrius, and it's a positivist view. Be confident in your prayer. When you pray, be confident. Because the one you speak with is God himself. Be confident because you are, through your baptism, the beloved son or daughter of God. Be confident that in striving after holiness and perfection, God will work through you and speak to you. He wouldn't call us to this unless he was going to bless us in some way. Okay. So now I would like to talk to, in the second session about John Cashin and St. Isaac of Nineveh. Why these two people? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about John Cashin a little bit. And before I get into him, I'm going to give you a brief excursus on John Cashin. John Cashin is, um, he started Western monasticism in a sense. He was one of the, the first to start Cenobitic monasticism, so what we would know of as traditional monasteries today. He started those outside of uh, Marseille in the late 4th, early 5th century. Before he did this, though, John Cashin went to Syria and Egypt to consult with and to see the fathers, the monks who were living out in the desert uh, in modern-day Syria and Iraq and Iran and in modern-day Egypt. John Cashin wrote three books 
Two are really the only ones that are important. The last one is a book on the incarnation. Theologically speaking, John Cashin doesn't have a great deal of depth, um, and so it's not that great of a book. But his two important books are on monastic life. The first is uh, a rule of life for, for monks called The Institutes. It's a shorter book. The second is The Conferences, which is um, like the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And there's, there's uh, Germanus, who is a friend of Cassian's, is the interlocutor with a particular monk who was renowned for a, on a particular topic. And now, this right here is the Classics of Western Spirituality version of the conferences. The actual conferences are about a thousand pages long, um, so it's a lot longer. These are just kind of the, the brief ones. I didn't want to bring the huge big book. But um, Cassian is one of the few writers that Benedict, St. Benedict, in his rule, says should be read, particularly the conferences. Um, because of his understanding of the human person, his understanding of monastic life. The Institutes, again, it's a shorter tome. There are uh, 12 chapters in the Institutes. The first four are about monastic life. The last eight are on the, um, the eight deadly sins and the vices to be avoided in the spiritual life. Cassian um, is often, to be honest, is often associated with a heretical position called semi-Pelagianism. Again, I don't believe that he holds this position, but that, this is not the time for that. Um, but he was accused in his lifetime of basically holding that there are some things that are good that we can start without God's grace that then God brings to fulfillment through his grace. I don't, argue, I don't believe he holds that position given his entire corpus, but he is, uh, to be honest with you, accused of that. But uh, yeah. Isaac, on the other hand, is later. He's a seventh century hermit. There's little that has been spoken of him in the West, except in probably the last 50 years, when his monastic writings started to be translated into more popular, uh, or more, uh, not, yeah, more popular languages. Cardinal Sarah actually, in his book, quotes him, and I would like to read that. This is what Isaac has to say about silence. Love silence above all things, because it brings you near to fruit that the tongue cannot express. First, let us force ourselves to be silent, and then from out of this silence, something is born that leads us into silence itself. If you begin with this discipline, I know not how much light will dawn on you from it. Great is the man who, by the patience of his members, achieves wondrous habits in his soul. When you put all the works of this discipline on one side and silence on the other, you will find the latter to be greater in weight. So why am I choosing these two? These are esoteric people. These are people maybe you've never even heard of before. And here's why. They show the importance of the Eastern tradition in our understanding of silence. Oftentimes we kind of jump to the scholastics or we jump to John of, Av or John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila in terms of our understanding of prayer in the West. But the Eastern tradition is enormously important in our understanding of prayer. Cashin went there and then brought it to the West in many ways. Isaac lived there his entire life. They also represent the two different types of being uh, in the, in, in, of, of trying to pursues silence at that point, cenobitic monasticism, so monasticism in a community, and the eremitic life, being a hermit. Okay? And yet, there's a lot of things that they talk about because of the practice of both that overlap, that help us to understand how anyone who pursues the life of silence or perfection is going to encounter these obstacles. And so we'll look to those who have tried to do it in extreme and understand how that helps to infuse and teach us in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay, so John Cashin. John Cashin writes in the conferences, the, the very first conference, the goal of monastic life is what? Purity of heart. Purity of heart. So when you, this whole practice, this whole life that we live is about purifying the self, purifying the heart so that God can speak. Again, prayer, especially the deepest prayer, especially contemplation, comes from God. Those true gifts come from God. And so the life that we live is about purifying our heart, purifying our soul, so that we can listen more perfectly to the will, to the word of God. For Cashin, and I think for all of us, purity of heart is the sine qua non, that without which we cannot go in the moral and the spiritual life. 
Purity of heart is the thing that makes it possible for God to speak. This is why, so for instance, when we look at the, the teaching of the church, you cannot enter into a state of contemplation if you're in a state of mortal sin. Because you've, you've chosen to divest yourself from God's love. Uh, you've chosen that. And God wants you to be with him, and he wants you to come into that state of grace so that he can infuse those things into you more fully. You know, and we cannot enter into a state of contemplation unless we're living a Christian life. We might get glimpses of God, but the fullness of contemplation only comes from a life lived in Christ, a life lived in the fullness of his teaching in relationship to him. Cashin also helps us to understand in this goal of this purity of heart is that the end must always be our focus and our goal. At the, actually, I think it's the last canon in the Code of Canon Law. It says all of these canons are to keep in mind the fact that we want people to go to heaven. All of these things should lead people to salvation. All right? So all of our life, whether it be monastic, eremitic, married, whatever our life, student, whatever, should have that end goal, that purity of heart, that life of silence, that life of perfection so that God can speak within us. And it should be the thing toward which we orient our life. All too often I hear as a priest, oh, Father, and especially because I work with you know, college students, when I get out of college, then I'll start taking my moral life or my spiritual life more seriously. You know, when this, you know, when this obligation ends, then I'll have time for it. And any of us, and I mean, I, I speak as a priest who's lived, you know, especially in my 20s, I spent in seminary. Any of us will say that whenever we put something off, we find that when we get to that point, oftentimes another thing comes up that gets in the way. So until we start to prioritize that, until we start to put that end in mind and orient our life around that, excuse me, we are going to struggle to have silence in our life, to have purity of heart, to have real pure prayer. Cashin, in his third conference, talks about the three renunciations that we need in order to achieve this purity of heart. We need to have the renunciation of our body, our past vices and passions, and the here and the visible. So the body. We need to move beyond bodily things. Silence is prioritizing the spiritual over the bodily, over the physical. And so we need to renounce from time to time, we need to deny ourselves from time to time certain bodily things. You know, having a day where we only, or a week where we only drink water, or where we don't snack between meals, or we don't have dessert except on holy days or Sundays. Those little renunciations of our body help to open up our life to this purity of heart because we're starting to prioritize not me, but Jesus, but the Lord and his voice. Our past vices, our past, our vices, and our passions, the next thing we need to renounce. Anytime we enter into prayer, it seems like the first thing we encounter is that stray thought of that past sin. And it's either enticing or we feel shame. Or those things we sit down to pray and we're thinking about, you know, how am I going to pay this bill? Or how am I going to take care of this relationship? We sometimes need to renounce that, put that aside for a minute. Or to overcome that, to pray through that to say that this is not going to distract me in prayer. This is not going to be the thing that drives my prayer right now. It's an important thing. And we have to pay the bills. We have to do all these things. But I, we have to deny ourselves that a little bit. We can't mess around with that in our brain. And Isaac of Nineveh will help us understand how to do that. And last, we have to, we have to put ourselves outside of the here and the now, the visible. We have to start looking toward the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly reality. Because that's what the Lord is calling us toward. But he also wants us to experience that here and now. And so when Cashin gets then to prayer, the ninth and 10th conference, and I would highly recommend this book, by the way, the conferences from the Classics of Western Spirituality on conference, on Cashin. The ninth and the 10th conference, is, are, are, as far as I'm concerned, some of the best brief excursions on prayer that I've ever read. And what does Cashin talk about? This purity of heart that he talks about in the very first conference, it leads to uninterrupted dedication to prayer. Not only that, but for every obstacle in life that we face, there is a corresponding step toward perfection in prayer. 
So the obstacles that the Lord puts in our way are actually an invitation for us to overcome them, for us to walk with the Lord through them to him. So these steps are pretty straightforward and simple. We remove all concern for bodily things. We enter humbly and virtuously into the practice of a life, and we restrain our soul. When I say restraint of soul, that's not to say that like bodily restraint. It's that spiritual restraint from thinking uh, or from going too far afield. It's restraining our soul to stay present to the Lord and focus on meditating on his life and his word as opposed to wandering off aimlessly into our thoughts and into whatever pops into our head. He also has this wonderful image of the soul when he talks about it in the ninth conference. And it's of a feather that our soul is the most delicate and beautiful feather. And that when it's unimpeded, when it's unencumbered, the slightest and gentlest breeze raises it up to God, lifts it on high. The slightest breeze will lift it up and float closer and closer and closer to the heavens. But when that little feather, when that beautiful, wonderful feather is encumbered by just a little bit of moisture, just a little bit of you know, any sort of trash or anything bad, it is weighed down. And even the strongest breeze won't lift it up. And so in our prayer life, in our spiritual life, one of the challenges and one of the goals is to try and rid ourselves, to move away from those things that weigh us down so that when we encounter God, we encounter him with no baggage. And this is really hard, admittedly. This is really hard. And I'll get into this with Isaac and Nineveh in a minute. But what this also helps us to understand, too, is that we are called in our prayer to stay away from matters beyond our aspiration. In other words, the groceries can wait when we're praying. That when we pray, we should aspire toward God, not toward making sure I figure out all the rest and trying to drive those things and push those things aside. That the aspiration in prayer is God is his love, is his goodness. Prayer is also preparation and practice for prayer. Now, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, but it's like when uh, I love to read, and I can read especially uh, you know, fiction very fast. And people ask sometimes, well, how do you read so quickly? Because I read. You know, because that's something I do. It's a practice. You know, how does someone run, how does a Kenyan run the marathon in three hours and five minutes? Because they run every day really, really hard. They work really, really hard. So for us, prayer is a preparation and practice for prayer. Because some days we just walk in and, we, and it's almost like we clock in and we clock out. We're just kind of like, well, that was a slog. I don't know what the Lord was trying to do today. But it's that dedication, it's that commitment that then opens it up so that when we have that day where everything falls together, everything lines up. And we walk out and we walk into the chapel and it's as if, as if time stands still. And it might only last a moment, but that moment is worth more than anything else we could ever be given. But we need that practice to get there and Cash and, 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 and tells his monk that. He also talks about the four types of prayer. And again, when we talk about prayer, remember, we're talking about vocal prayer, speaking to God, or meditation prayer, wrestling with either divine truth or, or meditating on the life of Christ. So he talks about prayer, petition, intercession, and thanksgiving. For cash and prayer is the simple offering to God. I'll pray, so there's, it's, a, it's kind of weird, the vocabulary here, and I apologize on behalf of John Cashin for his lack of distinction here, but he's defining prayer by calling it prayer, and that doesn't help anyone. Um, but when we, he, so the prayer for Cashin and, and the types of prayer, the first one is prayer, which is just simply an offering to God. It's just a gift. It's an offering to God. The second is petition. For Cashin, a petition is a plea on account of our sin. So when I ask God for something, it's because of my brokenness, because of sin, because of the weight of sin on the world. Intercession is pretty simple. It's intercession for others. Thanksgiving is a little different. Oftentimes when we talk about Thanksgiving... We can have, okay, you know, with this Thanksgiving, right? We give thanks to God. For Cashin, it's a looking for and toward the Lord. Thanksgiving is to recognize that God is in the world, God is in my life, and I need to look for him, and I need to find him. 
Right? When these things are done together, when all these types of prayer are done, this again then is preparation for the infusing of God's will in contemplation. Okay. So I'd like to read a brief passage from the Ninth Conference to you. So not only are all of these things necessary, but we also need to sometimes pull back and be alone with the Lord. And this is what Cashin says. We need to be especially careful to follow the gospel precept, which instructs us to go into our room to shut the door so that we may pray to our Father. And this is how we can do it. We pray in our room whenever we withdraw our hearts completely from the tumult and the noise of our thoughts and our worries, and when secretly and intimately we offer our prayers to the Lord. We pray with a door shut when, without opening our mouths and in perfect silence, we offer our petitions to the one who pays no attention to words, but who looks hard at our hearts. We pray in secret when in our hearts alone and in our recollected spirits, we address God and reveal our wishes only to him and in such a way that the hostile powers themselves have no inkling of their nature. Hence, we must pray in utter silence, not simply in order that our whispers and our cries do not prove both a distraction to our brothers standing nearby and a nuisance to them when they themselves are praying, but also says so as to ensure that the thrust of our pleading be hidden from our enemies who are especially lying in wait to attack us during our prayers. In this way, we shall fulfill the command, keep your mouth shut from the one who sleeps on your breast. This is from Micah chapter 7, verse 5. So not only do we have to do all of these external practices and understand prayer, but we have to turn silently to the Lord, even if it's in company. This is one of the reasons why the Mass is so beautiful. That it is not noise punctuated by silence, but it's silence punctuated by noise. The Mass should lead us in the midst of our brothers and sisters, sometimes shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters, into a greater silence. This is why liturgy should be beautiful, should be solemn, should be something that moves us beyond the ordinary. Oftentimes it's easy to think that we want to walk out of Mass on a, on a spiritual high, but sometimes we need to walk out of Mass shaken to our core by the majesty and the beauty of God. There can be great diversity in our liturgy, but it also helps us to understand why silence is so important there. Why kneeling down after communion, while taking a few minutes before and after Mass to prepare and to give thanks are so important because the Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity has come to us, has fed us, and desires in some way, shape, or form to speak to us. Cashin helps us to understand that. That we don't need to walk off to the mountains. We can do that right here, right now, if that's our desire, if that's what we want, if that's our practice, if our life enables us to do that. I remember when I was in the novitiate, I had probably been there maybe a couple of weeks, and in the novitiate, at least that year, um, it changes a little bit year to year, we were required to do 30 minutes of meditation before morning prayer and 30 minutes of meditation before evening prayer. And um, having really not, you know, I was a teacher beforehand and I was also a huge nerd. And so I would basically go to school, teach, and then I'd come home and I'd read all night, pray the rosary, go to bed. Um, and then there was like, I have to sit for an hour every day and be quiet. I don't know if I can do this. You know, I like, I like this whole Dominican thing, but if they're going to make me pray like this, there's just no way I can do this. And yet when you start to get, and then also, I have to do this with the brothers in the chapel? Like, they make noises. They, you know, the chairs, you know, the pews creak. How am I supposed to be quiet when all of this is going around? You know, they cough from time to time. How is that possible? And yet the Lord starts to speak. In the things that are going on around us, we can start to find silence. In just simply recognizing, wait a second, I'm in the chapel. I'm in the presence of the blessed Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And not only that, but I start to see in my brothers Christ. 
And I also see the brokenness of humanity in my brothers. And all of a sudden, we, it, that, that silence, that going to your inner room starts to make more sense. But it was the practice of weeks and months before it started to make any sense to me whatsoever. I thought to myself, why can't the novice master just trust that I'll spend an hour after Compline in the chapel every night? Why can't he just trust me on that? Well, because he's, you know, he's also astute in the ways of human knowledge and the human heart. Right? He knows that I might spend 10 minutes in the chapel and fall asleep. All right? So this is the challenge that we have in our life. And Cashin helps us to understand that, that all of these practices lead us so that wherever we are, whenever we are there, we can retreat into that, going into my room and praying to the Lord in silence. This is the goal. That's what purity of heart enables, is that I can then, you know, that's why that, you know, the monks, the Desert Fathers, talk about becoming all flame, that at any moment, when I have this pure heart, when I have this life, the silence of the Lord can be, in, <coughs> excuse me, can be pregnant, can be powerful, can be worthwhile. <clears throat> okay. So then, Cashin, and this is one of the beautiful things about the conferences, is that it's a series, it's 23 or 23 or 24, now I'm drawing a blank, um, conferences, and there are very few repeats. There's only actually one repeat back to back on the same topic in the whole conferences, and that's nine and 10 on prayer, okay? And in 10, Cashin goes even further into prayer, and he gives us practical advice on how to pray. So now he gives us this theory, and now he's gonna give us a practical advice. And he peels back the veil, and we begin to see the necessity of words in achieving silence. That silence isn't achieved beyond words. Silence is achieved oftentimes through our words. We, words bring us back. We are linguistic people. We need a model to pray. We can't just sit down in the church. We have to have an intentionality. We have to have an idea of what we're going to try and do. An athlete doesn't just go to the gym every day. An athlete goes with a plan, and so must we. And this is where Cashin comes in. And it's affected the Western church because it affected St. Benedict. So every time a priest or religious sits down to pray the divine office, they start with, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. This is from Psalm 69, 2. In Latin, Deus in auditorium meum intende, Domine ad adjuvanda me festina. Cashin is the one who says, this is your prayer. Wherever you are, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. Whatever situation you're in, this prayer will draw you closer to the Lord. When you wake up, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. When you are tempted to say a negative word, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. When you are just desperate and in need of God's love because your world is falling apart, God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. It is a necessary prayer, and it is a useful prayer. Why? Because it puts us in a proper relationship to God, and it orders our thoughts. Who is going to be the one who speaks in silence? God. Why? Because he helps me. Lord, make haste to help me. God, come to my assistance. It helps us to see God in all things. That when I have this simple prayer on my heart, I can enter into the silence that is necessary. When my world comes crashing down, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do. Someone I love is hurting, or I'm hurting because someone I love has done something to me. I don't know how to see God. Where is he in this? God, come to my assistance. Lord, make haste to help me. And it draws us into that meditation. It draws us into that reflection upon God's goodness, God's generosity. It leads to true prayer. And for Cashin, a true prayer is a fiery outbreak. True prayer is something that is, in a sense, we can't control. We want to control our prayer, but silence leads to the fact that sometimes I'm going to sit down in that chapel and God is going to rock my world. And that's a good thing. That's what true prayer is. Fire is a dangerous thing. The Holy Spirit's image is fire. And that's what the Lord is trying to do. He's trying to set us afire and move us closer to him. So, Cashin, in conclusion, helps us to understand that 
Prayer is a gradual ascent. He builds on this. He says, we start with this effort, we make it, we persevere, we move slowly but surely up. We have this simple but consistent way of praying, and it helps us to grow more and more in our union with the Lord. He's practical, he's simple, and it's repeatable. And not only that, but he helps us to understand and reflect upon this. God desires this for us. This isn't just the desire of our heart, it's the desire of the Lord himself. And lastly, and I said it before and I'll say it again, Cashin helps us to understand that prayer is strengthened by prayer. When you need to pray, pray. When you don't know what to do, pray. And this helps us then to enter into that silence so that when something comes to us, we can see the face of the Lord, even through all of the muck and the mire. And so now I'd like to use Isaac of Nineveh because I think he helps us to understand the great challenge in prayer, which is overcoming ourselves, overcoming our brokenness, and overcoming this wonderful gift that the Lord has given to us, our mind that wanders sometimes aimlessly through the forest of our life. And so Isaac talks about pure and undistracted prayer. And you would think to yourself, you know, because oftentimes we're influenced by crazy Buddhism or things like that, or like, you know, the, the, the new age kind of stuff, that just being quiet is, you know, the end in and of itself. And what does Isaac say about what is pure and undistracted prayer? It's the freedom from wandering thoughts, not just empty thoughts. It's knowing what to do with my wandering thoughts. Because sometimes a wandering thought can come into prayer, and that's actually the Holy Spirit. Sometimes a wandering thought can come into prayer, and that's the enemy. Or that's something that doesn't need to be prayed about or thought about at all. You know, it's, uh, what am I going to get at the grocery store after I'm done praying here? And what does Isaac say is that our pure and undivided prayer, or excuse me, our pure and undistracted prayer, which stems from purity of heart, helps us to understand and recognize good versus bad wandering. And I'm going to read something to you from him. This is a book. It's called The Syriac Fathers on Prayer and the Spiritual Life. Um, I would not recommend it to you unless you are serious about learning really and reading really esoteric things, but it does have quite a bit of Isaac of Nineveh in here. And here's what he says about our uh, good versus bad wandering. <clears throat> in the case of someone who struggles to tie down his thoughts and from wandering on such things, or his mind from wandering of its own accord on them during prayer, he is of unparalleled stupidity if he thinks that this kind of wandering is alien to and outside the limits of pure prayer. For we do not consider as alien to purity of prayer and detrimental to recollection of thoughts in prayer any profitable recollections that may spring from the writings of the Spirit, resulting in insights and spiritual understanding of the divine world during the time of prayer. For someone to examine and to think in a recollected manner about the object of his supplication and the request of his prayer is an excellent kind of prayer, provided it is consonant with the intention of our Lord's commandment. This kind of recollection of mind is very good. In other words, sometimes we are led to deeper prayer by recognizing the wandering of our mind and by following it if we recognize it as good. If we recognize it as something that could lead to a deeper understanding of the life of Christ and our relationship to that, or a deeper understanding of divine truth. If we just try to get rid of all of the wandering thoughts, Isaac tells us, if we just try and sit there and have nothing on our brain, we are, as he said, stupid. His words, not mine. Because the Lord speaks and writes in our hearts through his spirit. And his spirit is fire. And sometimes fire is uncontrollable. I'd love it if the Holy Spirit was this nice little hearth in my, ho in my heart, and I could go in there, and I could sit, and I could get warm by it. But what the Holy Spirit wants to do is escape from that hearth and burn the house in a good and holy fire, like the fire of the burning bush. But the Holy Spirit desires to set everything on fire with his love and with his mercy and with his grace. And so we have to, in prayer, recognize that sometimes we're going to move in a direction that's not necessarily where we intended we also, though, need external silence. We need stillness. So pure prayer for Isaac of Nineveh only comes after the practice of stillness, of being able to sit and to rest. Because we can then, 
Only then can we truly empty the mind and turn the heart. To be able to sit, or for Isaac of Nineveh, a big thing for him, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is we have to be able to sit or stand or kneel or prostrate. In fact, in the Syrian church, and we actually see this amongst our Muslim brothers and sisters, in the Syrian church, it was a sign of purity if your forehead had been flattened because you were spending so much time in prostrations. You were putting your forehead, literally pressing your forehead against the floor with such constancy and with such vigor that you were praying intentionally. And so for Isaac uh, of Nineveh, when we talk about pure prayer, it comes from stillness that talks about control of the body. And I'll get to that in a minute in terms of uh, bodily posture. But also for Isaac of Nineveh is for us to remember again the difference between our prayer and the Lord's infused vision, contemplation. That if my goal is contemplation, I have to recognize that not everyone achieves that in this life. That contemplation comes to everyone who's in heaven, that we see the face of God, we know him as, as we are capable of knowing him, we are happy and with him and completely fulfilled for the rest of our lives. And contemplation is a glimpse, a vision of that heavenly reality. And our prayer can put us in position to see that, but our prayer ceases when the Lord starts to infuse himself. And so that's important for us to understand that the work that I do is not contemplation. That's God's work. The work that I do is I put myself in position to be open to that experience. Prayer is our universal call, but seeing is a gift to the few. Contemplation, he calls it seeing, is a gift to the few. For us and for Isaac, prayer, our acts of silence, is a standing at the door of the kingdom of contemplation and knocking. But we can't open the door. We can't raise the gate. He also encourages us again to pray through our distractions. If only that bell wasn't ringing, if only that person wasn't breathing so loudly, if only the floor wasn't creaking, I could truly pray. And yet if we can enter into that prayer, if we can pray through that, we will strengthen ourselves for the Lord. And um, lastly, for Isaac, again, Again, it's the Desert Fathers talk about this. Cashin talks about this. And if I would have had more time, St. Benedict would have talked about this. We have to have a rule of prayer. We have to follow a pattern. I have, I've learned this the hard way in my own life. Well, I'll make you know, my holy hour later in the day. And then it's like 11 o'clock at night, and I've just gotten out of like my fifth straight meeting. And the holy hour is not very enticing at that point in the day. But when you stick to that, this time of day is going to be my time of real committed prayer. Then it infuses into our life. When my morning ritual becomes not just a getting up, having a cup of coffee, brushing my teeth, showering, shaving, whatever, but becomes an act of prayer. When I wake up and I say, and give myself first and foremost to the word of God, read the gospel for the day, and then use my morning ritual to be an act of meditation on that. When I have a pattern with which I follow, then my life is open and free and silence becomes permeated throughout my entire life. Because I'm opening my heart to the Lord in all that I do. We need scripture in that. We need a strict rule. We need to become a disciple of prayer. We also need to, and Cashin talks about this, know our mind and observe what our mind is doing. If my mind wanders during prayer and I don't take note of that and address that, something's wrong. If I'm thinking about a construction project or the groceries every day at prayer and I don't make an act to change that, then I have somehow, I'm not following a rule. I'm not using the gifts that the Lord has given me to grow in prayer. And lastly, and this is a big thing, especially in the East and not so much in the West, unfortunately, but it's the importance of bodily posture. Standing, prostrating, kneeling, Laying on the floor. Sometimes the monks would lay on the floor, prostrate before the Lord for days. These are absolutely and vitally essential to our prayer. Using our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, to pray, to teach, to act. So, Isaac of Nineveh helps to show us 
that when we embrace the challenges of prayer, the distractions, a wandering mind, anything that gets thrown in our path, we actually are taking a greater step towards silence because we're incorporating the earthly reality into our prayer. We're using what the Lord sometimes put before us as distractions and making them thrones upon which we conquer our enemy. The body, which is often an afterthought in prayer, requires attention and can serve as a valuable instrument in our prayer. Self-renunciation for Cassian is oftentimes fashion, or fasting. For Isaac of Nineveh, it would be the same, but it also requires there to be a physical element to our prayer. We need to put ourselves in a position that we might not normally be in, in that intense prayer. And last, and this is for all of the writers, but especially Isaac of Nineveh, we need a plan, and we need to observe it. If I want to live silently, if I want to proclaim God's message, I need to follow a rule of life and a rule of prayer that makes sense, that's practical, that I can achieve. So if you're married and have a bunch of kids and you're going to start living like a Benedictine monk, that's incompatible with your vocation. But you can start to implement different ways of being like that. You can, instead of going to office for two hours in the evening or in the early hours of the morning, pray with your family. You can do things that throughout the day permeate your prayer. On your way to work, you know, you can pray the rosary. On your way home, you can pray a divine mercy chaplet. You can figure out a way to talk with the Lord, to listen to the Lord, so that your whole life becomes one of prayer. And so, in conclusion, for both of my talks today, I'd just like to recognize, to recap what we talked about with the Desert Fathers, Cashin and Isaac. The Desert Fathers, the earliest who took after the Christian life, show us the desire we have as Christians for time with God. It is innate to our baptismal nature to desire to be with God. It is innate to our human nature to desire to know God, and our baptismal nature makes it even stronger. Silence, regular meditation, the life of Christ in Scripture are essential to our life, and the monks of the desert show us that. They also show us that it's practical skills and common sense that are needed to pursue such a life. Just running after something because it's bright and shiny will lead to nowhere. We have to go after it, and we have to go after it, understanding who I am and understanding the goal and putting practical steps in the way, along the way, excuse me. Cashin shows us the necessity of organizing our life for silence, practicing silence, and developing those skills to promote prayer and silence. Having something that's simple that can draw us into prayer at all times is essential for Cashin and for us in that pursuit of silence. Having whatever it is that we need, whether it just be a crucifix or a rosary we carry in our pocket, it be that word, God, come to my assistance, Lord, make haste to help me, an image in our house, that thing, that little thing can be of great use and of great succor in our prayer life. And finally, Isaac of Nineveh helps us to understand that the roadblocks, the obstacles, the challenges are actually and can oftentimes be an invitation from our Lord to deeper and more permanent prayer. They can be a gift to pure and uninterrupted prayer. So for us, what does this mean as we prepare for the coming of Christ at Christmas, as we ask the Lord to help us be greater preachers of his word and of his life? The first is we are made for silence. We need silence and we need to pray. The second is that this won't come easily or naturally. It is a daily battle, even for priests and religious, even for those who have dedicated their lives to it. Prayer is a daily battle for each and every one of us. If we want to pray, we must work at it ceaselessly every day. When, though, a soul is formed, eager and prayerful, the most important part of our evangelization is complete. When prayer becomes not that thing we do when we need it, but when it becomes our very food and drink, the words we speak to those we encounter on the street, to those we speak in our families and in our friendships, we have been fed. Our strength and our confidence comes not from what I do, but from what the Lord is doing in my heart. The Lord is speaking to me. The Lord is strengthening me. The Lord is merciful and kind. 
The coming of Christ can be heard in the recesses of our hearts. Jesus enters silently and poorly into the world in Bethlehem. He desires to do the same for our life. In this Advent season, which begins this evening, it is also a penitential season. It is my encouragement to all of you to use this penitential season to up your game regarding prayer and the rule of prayer you follow. Maybe it means being serious about, I'm going to pray at this time every day. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to spend the first 15, 20 minutes, which is 1% of your day, in prayer, in meditation on scripture. Use this wonderful season to invite Christ to come into your life and into your heart. The life of Christ is the center of a life of meditation and silence. The incarnation is the great gift that the Lord gives. He becomes one of us. May this Advent season be a meditation, silent, powerful, palpable meditation on that wonderful gift of the incarnate Lord who loves us so much that he took on our humanity in all things but sin. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to him who loves us. And thanks be to him who speaks silently and lovingly in our hearts.